Good morning, class. Welcome back to the book of Acts. Those of you that are watching online, we are into chapter 16 of the book of Acts here today. Uh, just a program note again for those of you that are watching these online at whatever point in time. Um, these are being given during the ABC class here in 2023. So any of my references to events that are current to the time, just under, understand that. Also, appreciate the notes that I've received from many members and others watching these Acts classes. If um, you want to continue to send those in, I appreciate hearing how uh, you are hearing them and uh, thoughts and input, but I appreciate um, all, all of that as well. It seems that a number of people are benefiting from these classes. So I know for you guys here, it's a little bit different than what I would normally, the way I would present things. Uh, we're kind of stuck here within the camera, but it all works. But at chapter 16, we are into the second journey of the Apostle Paul. And this uh, is moving into a few chapters here in this journey and, and the episodes of chapters 16, 17, 18, and 19 that are uh, personally, these are my favorite passages within the book of Acts. Um, they're wonderful stories. There's a great deal of instruction for the church and uh, understanding to, to gain from them. And it's just um, uh, uh, packed with, uh, to me, uh, just the essence of what the uh, church was like and the, the mission work that Paul was doing, the evangelizing during that period of time in, the, uh, in, in, the, in his ministry. And we're going through uh, today, we're going to you know, leap over into the continent of Europe and um, go to Philippi. And ultimately, he'll come back around to, uh, to Ephesus. And then as the chapters progress, we will talk about what, what he did at Ephesus and, and that part of the story as well. And so let's look at um, the, um, the story here in Acts chapter 16. Let me pull it up here in my scriptures, make sure I don't uh, omit anything here. But um, It says that in verse 1, when they came to Derby and Lystra, now they are making their way back through the area of um, Asia, Asia Minor at the time. They started down here in Antioch, and they are working their way back. Remember that Paul and Barnabas wanted to visit the churches, or at least Paul did, and then he and Barnabas had a dispute because Barnabas wanted to bring John Mark along. Paul didn't, and so we wind, wind up with two different teams going out. And Paul and Silas are now involved in this. And they come to, um, they retrace this, the steps. They come to Derby and to Lystra. Remember, it was at Lystra that Paul was stoned in, in his first journey and dragged out of the city for dead, but got up and went on down to the city of Derby. So it is in Lystra, it says here in verse 1 of chapter 16, that a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Uh, Lystra and Iconium, you'll see on the, on the map again, they were very uh, not that very far apart. Uh, and so it gives you an indication there was a bit of uh, 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 communication between the two groups of disciples that had been formed in, into a church here in those two cities that Timothy was, had a reputation among both of them who were at that, in these two areas. His mother was Jewish, and when, we, when you get into the book of 1 Timothy, uh, you will find that uh, Timothy comes from a line, not only his mother, but his grandmother were members, it seems, or at least they were, they were not members of the church as we look at it, but they were, they were Jewish. They were believers. And so this is the lineage. Um, his, Timothy's mother married a Gentile, and he was Greek, and uh, so he is following along, let's say, in the path of his mother's teaching, and she must be very active in teaching him the Scriptures, schooling him in the Jewish history and uh, the, the Old Testament Scriptures uh, from the, the synagogue and, and, and all there, but we don't hear anything about, we don't even have a name for the father. We assume that he is not in, in the picture in terms of a, re, a religious upbringing. Uh, we know nothing else uh, about him. But 
The example of Timothy and obviously his faith and all commends him to Paul. So in verse 3 it says, Paul wanted to have him go with, go on with him and join he and Silas. Um, he become, would become then kind of what we, we would term today a, a trainee, um, a ministerial trainee. And again, Timothy then becomes a full minister. And again, First and Second Timothy are written to him when he's pastoring later at the city of Ephesus, the church at Ephesus. So uh, keep that in, that in mind. So here is the drafting, if you will, into the ministry and the, for a training period of Timothy. Now, it says Paul took him and circumcised him. And so he had a Jewish mother, but a Greek father. And so the father had not had him circumcised. And for whatever reason, the mother didn't prevail upon him uh, to have that done. But he does it because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. All right. In the eyes of the Jews, Timothy was Greek. Uh, but in the eyes of the uh, Greeks, Timothy was a Jew because he was following along with his mother. And Paul wants to remove any problem and point of discussion. He goes ahead and has him circumcised. And we assume he's a young man. This is a little bit different than doing it at eight days uh, for an infant. Um, he just settles the issue. It was socially expedient for Paul to do that, uh, but not legally required. This issue, remember, has been settled back in chapter 15. But it, was not, it would not be wrong to have had left him um, sir, uh, uncircumcised, and it is not you know, violating any, any principle to have him circumcised. It's not backtracking whatsoever. So uh, take that as you will from the, the example here. Um, Luke notes it, is, is inspired by God to note this, but then Paul just did not want this to be of, of an issue because of the mixed parentage and the issue that had just been settled. And so they, as they went through the cities, verse 4, they delivered to them the decrees to keep them keep, which were determined by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem. And this was what we read about at the end of chapter 15, after the, the conference uh, in J Jerusalem settled the issue of circumcision. There were four items, remember, that were uh, the uh, Gentiles were admonished not to do um, to... Um, what was it, uh, verse 29 of chapter 15? They were to abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, uh, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Those were specifics dealing with the temple worship. Uh, essentially, they were told, stay out of the temple. And uh, these uh, four things, which seem to be, um, uh, let's say, a temptation and a problem, uh, but if they kept away from all of those, then everything else would follow. But they, they read all of this and reported on it to these churches. And remember, these were the congregations uh, that Paul had started on the first journey. Verse 5 tells us, so, as a result of this, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. And so there, there's a period of growth. There's a, a period of excitement and activity that is taking place here, reminiscent of the early days of the church in Jerusalem that we read about at the beginning of the story of Acts. And the, 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 uh, the efforts that are being made here uh, are quite, quite strong and, and uh, obviously um, quite, quite, quite valuable. And so at, at this particular point, in verse 6 it says, when they had gone through Phrygia, and the region of Galatia. Now this, I'm going to put this, if you watch, are watching on the map on the screen, you've got this map in your syllabus, but uh, those of you online, this uh, hopefully will pick up too. The region of Galatia is the southern part of, um, of uh, Asia Minor here that he's already been through. And they're making their way up to Pisidian, uh, obviously, Pisidian Antioch it would, would probably would no doubt be a, one of the stops that he's making, even though Luke does not mention this. Um, and it, it, tell, it says here that they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia at the end of chapter 6. Now, as we look at what is being referred to here, to here as Asia, at one level, this entire area, of what is today Turkey, uh, and anciently Asia Minor, north, south, east, and west, would be considered Asia. 
and certainly even regions you know, further east. But for the um, intent of our story and the geographical range of the, of the book of Acts here, um, given where Paul is, what I think we are being told here by Luke is that Paul's intent is to go from the area of Phrygia here at Pisidian Antioch, uh, and as it says, he, was, he, he probably wanted to go into the more uh, the well-populated area of Western Asia, which put, would have put him over here in Ephesus. And all the other cities that we read about in Revelation 2 and 3 that are the seven uh, cities where there were congregations and the messages of uh, Christ to those churches, including many, many other uh, cities. It was a, a quite a heavily populated region, very fertile, a lot of manufacturing, a lot going on, and Paul knew that. And he saw uh, that there were Jewish synagogues, there was a, a, a presence and a very ripe area for preaching the gospel. And so I think that's what, he's being, what is being said here when um, they, they are forbidden by, by the Holy Spirit to preach the word into Asia. Now, how are they forbidden? It, Luke doesn't say that Paul had a vision. He's going to later say that he did to go to, to, uh, uh, into Europe. Uh, there's no other voice, no other indication. Um, you know, it, it could have been circumstances that, that, are, that arose that forbid them to go there. Um, it, it could be that he had a, a, a vision and Luke is just not led to record it. It just doesn't say. What it does tell us, though, is that it is God and Christ who are guiding and, and directing. And at this point in time, he doesn't go into that area. And so what he seems to do, it says in verse 7, they came to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia. That would have put him, and, and the, the route turns north, Bithynia then would have put him over further east. But here's what it says, the Spirit did not permit them. They tried. Uh, they, maybe they couldn't get a transportation. They couldn't, you know, there was something else going on or um, something that, that, that stopped them from turning east and going into that area. Now, it's very obvious that God is guiding this journey, and He has a plan in mind. And it is not what Paul and Silas and now Timothy have in mind. Uh, as good as their plan would be. And one reason that we can pretty well assume, I think, and it's a, it's a good logical assumption why they were not able to go further east into Bithynia and over into the area that is also called Pontus, is this is territory where Peter will be, and it probably already is. And it, there's, there's somebody doing the work over there, Peter. God has other designs for Paul. And it, it is into essentially new territory that no one else has gone uh, before. And so what they do in verse 8, they pass by Mysia and they come down to Troas. So they turn west and they come down to the coast, to the city of Troas. And here is where they, in a sense, stop. You might, uh, they may be thinking, what do we do now? Uh, where do we go? What did we go? Maybe they, from here they could have easily gone south towards Sardis, uh, toward um, um, eventually you know Ephesus being the leading city in the region at the time. Uh, but what happens here is a vision. Verse nine: A vision appeared to Paul in the night. So here's a very explicit reference as to what happened. Uh, again, I, we don't know what forbid him to go other, to the other places other than. God uh, stopped it and guided his steps. I think sometimes, you know, you could, you could say that perhaps circumstances over a period of time led Paul to conclude that by going to Philippi over into Macedonia, which is what is going to happen, um, he, he then concludes maybe some days, weeks, or even months later that God was guiding it. It could have been something a bit more... Um, uh, uh, to the moment, in the moment, uh, that, that he concluded, wait a minute, God's not wanting us to go in either of these directions. Uh, then he gets this vision and he knows where God wants to go. But at some point, it, it becomes very clear. And verse 9 is, is the, the, the very clear path because he, he receives a vision and he sees him as a man 
of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. All right, now Macedonia is across uh, the water here from Troas, but he would have taken a, he'll take a boat, and he's going to go up to Philippi. And he is in the, the region of Macedonia. We all know the famous personage who comes from Macedonia, don't we? We studied in the book of Acts. Who is that? Or the book of Daniel, I should say. Alexander the Great, Alexander of Macedon. Um, he, uh, he's the most famous one from antiquity there. And so this is what he does. They, um, verse 10, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now here in, ver in, in verse 10, uh, the, the we pronoun uh, is a, a definite indicator that Luke now joins the party. All commentators see and understand that Luke, as he writes this history, inserts himself now. Um, at this point, he joins. Where does he come from? Some think that he, he is from Philippi. Uh, some commentators try to think that maybe in the vision, the vision is of Luke. Um, but there's no, you know, you can't conc really conclude that. But um, Luke joins them here. And it, it's obvious that that is where they are to go. And so now we have four in this party, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. And therefore, in verse 11, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, uh, the port, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days, end of verse 12. So they cross over. In, onto, into Macedonia, not only to Macedonia, but to Europe, an entirely new continent. And this is, uh, this is really a, a turning point in, uh, in the story in Acts, in, in, in history. Um, you know, a lot of commentators comment on what this means because now the gospel is going out of Asia. It is now going to Europe, what will become Europe and an entirely different region. And Paul will in time go to various cities here and spend uh, 18 months down in the city of Corinth and all, all on this particular journey. So here, here's what I think is a big takeaway. There's many, but um, as I said, God was guiding Paul and he didn't want him to go to Ephesus this time. Ephesus was on God's timetable, but not Paul's not, not at that moment. He's going to spend nearly three years in Ephesus, but not now. God's directing him to Macedonia, and he's going to have a number of uh, experiences and adventures, as we will read about, in Philippi, in Thessalonica, in Berea, uh, Athens, and then Corinth. And it's going to be a very productive uh, period of his ministry. Uh, uh, we, we get... Uh, uh, several congregations here, two of which, uh, three of which, letters of the New Testament will be written to. Philippi, Thess Thessalonica, the, church, the two uh, letters to the Thessalonians, and then the two letters to the Corinthians. And so there's, there's a lot of fruit here. And then there's, a, there's actually, um, if you will, a, a base and a platform, uh, as Paul writes to them, these letters then become a part of the, the canon or the New Testament, and we read a lot of instruction and get a lot of information about the times and the situations that we're, that we're dealing with at that, here at that point. And so this is where God wants Him to go. And, you know, whether it's in our own life or it's in the work of the church, we have to always seek God's guidance and, in a sense, you know, test the spirits, test the opportunities, Make sure that what we might think is an open door isn't a trap door, leading to, or leading to a trap door on the other side. Um, in whatever, you know, a job or a relationship or a place that you may think that you need to move to for whatever reason. Um, always seek God's guidance and use good judgment, use wisdom, and, uh, you know, get, get good counsel on that. When we Consider our, our efforts of preaching the gospel and the endeavors that we get into in the church. Sometimes we can't go here, we can't go there. And time and circumstance 
uh, show us that we sh we got to go a different direction. And we don't always know why we can't go here or there, but we find out later why God was guiding us. And sometimes it might be several months, it might be even several years. I've experienced this on a personal level, and the church has experienced it at, at their level as well. I've, um, I've been transferred to locations in my uh, field ministry career. I had no idea why somebody decided to send me someplace. And it was not until after I got there and, and time, in some cases a few years went by, that I finally realized that God was behind this, even though I thought it was a bunch of men doing it, that it was God that was behind it. And I've seen that in my own life, and you will too. You will too. So here they, they come over to, to Philippi. And um, it says in verse 12 that it was a foremost city of that part of Macedonia and a colony. What it was was a Roman colony. Uh, Philippi has a rich history. It takes its name from Philip, who was the father of Alexander the Great, Philip of Macedon. All right? And so uh, that's where we get Philippi. Uh, Philippi. It also has a rich history. Um, it was a location of a battle during the civil wars of Rome between um, the armies of Octavian, who becomes, becomes Augustus. And at that time, Mark Antony was aligned with him. And they defeat the assassins of Julius Caesar at Philippi in a, in a battle in, in the second or the first century BC. And so uh, that is a significant event that takes place there. Um, in subsequent years, Philippi becomes a place where there are a number of Roman soldiers who, when they leave the legions, they settle here. They've been settled here. So like we saw down in Antioch and Pisidia, when I, we went there, that was also a place where Augustus um, retired a lot of his soldiers. Philippi is the same place. And we'll, we'll, we'll understand that when we uh, come to one of the characters in the story here. And so it was a Roman colony administered by a Roman government and had a lot of retired Roman soldiers there. And that influenced uh, the, the city uh, quite, a, uh, quite a while here. Now, Paul is going to do something here then that is his custom. As we move along through the story, uh, through the story they were there for a few days, for some days it says. And so we would take that within, I would take that within, a, within a less than seven days. Um, because verse 13 says, On the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who were there. And so this tells us that there's not a synagogue in this city. The other locations, Paul's gone to the synagogue because there was a large enough Jewish population. In Philippi, it's mostly Roman, and there's not, en not enough men... I think uh, you, you had to have about, you had to have ten, 10 men as a quorum to form a Jewish synagogue in that period. So there, it tells us there weren't even 10 Jewish men there. And so very small Jewish uh, uh, population. And yet there are people who go on the Sabbath, uh, and it's a group of women who are on, down by this river, um, on the Sabbath day. <coughs> now, how does Paul know about know that? Well, he just probably asks around. He finds out there's not a synagogue. He probably talks to some people in the Agora, which is the marketplace, the open-air marketplace. And Paul was not bashful to inquire and find out if were there any believers, were there any God-fearers here? If there's not enough for a Jewish synagogue, then what's going on? Anybody in that city, and, and a group of women who were known to go down to the river on the Sabbath day to pray, would have caught the attention of other people in the city, and the, you know the tongues would have been clacking, and people would have talked about. They knew that, and so Paul was led somehow to find out that the, what was going on, and so that's where they go. And here is where we are introduced to a certain woman in verse fourteen named Lydia, who heard us. So Paul begins to teach here. And she was a seller of purple. So there must be a large, let's say a large group of women, among whom was Lydia. And it tells us that she was a seller of purple from the city of Theatira. Where have we heard about Theatira? 
one of the churches of Revelation. The, the fourth message, the fourth church reference there, the one right in the middle, the longest message that, uh, of the seven messages in, in Revelation. Um, and when we talked about Theatira in our class in, in Revelation, we talked the fact, about the fact that Theatira was a place where purple was manufactured, this dye. And so Lydia very likely was from Theatira, but she's now in Philippi. Why is she in Philippi? Because she's a seller of purple. She got the franchise for the purple franchise in Philippi, and it's very lucrative. And she was probably driving around in a purple Cadillac. Not a Cadillac, but maybe a purple chariot, all right? Okay, because she was probably pretty successful. We're going to find she's got a household and a place where Paul and his company can stay. And so it must have been a substantial house. She was probably doing quite well. The purple that was sold was sold to the upper classes and primarily the, the royalty. Um, in the Roman world, to wear the purple was a designation of the Caesar. Um, most people wore a white toga. If you were a senator, you might have a colored band that went across it that designated a particular status or class that you were in. But if you wore purple, you were at the top of the heap. And so the purple was, in a sense, reserved for, for them. There's a, a great story I'll, I'll, I'll tell you when we come to Revelation um, 13 about the wearing of the purple as it pertains to a story out of Revelation 13. But we'll, we'll keep going here with Lydia, um, who's a seller of purple from the, the city of Theatira. Now, beyond being obviously a, a woman and, say, a businesswoman, she's obviously successful. And keep in mind, in the Greek world, in the Roman world, the Greco-Roman world, she's standing out. Women didn't normally rise to independent status like she evidently has. And so she's an anomaly, an outlier in the world at this time. We, there, are, uh, uh, there are some inscriptions in other cities, I believe in Ephesus and in Sardis. They have found pillars, tablets with inscriptions of people's names and the prominent people of the cities. And on two, two places, they have found the name Lydia. And it's in connection of, of, of a group of names that, that we know are of a prominent class of people in those cities. And so where we have seen the name Lydia, found it from archaeological evidence, um, it is of, of prominent people within the city. So maybe that's also telling us something about this Lydia in, in Philippi. But what is most important is what is in the last part of the phrase, she worshiped God. She was a God-fearer. She's probably Gentile, and she's a, she is a, probably a God-fearer. Maybe she began doing this in the synagogue in Theatira. Uh, that's a speculation. But she continued in, in Philippi. It says, The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And so she's already tuned into something, of, you know, the, the God of Abraham, the Old Testament, the Scriptures uh, that would, she no doubt heard uh, very likely in, in a synagogue in Theatira. She brought that, that with her, and she listens. And verse 15 tells us, When she and her household were baptized, she begged us, uh, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. So she's got a house that's big enough for four people to stay in it, but she's also got a household, which means probably servants, and that's a euphemism for slaves, all right, they, that she probably owned. That was very common in, that, in the world. I'm not getting into the issue of slavery as it pertains to the teachings of Paul. I think your epistles class probably gets into that with uh, uh, more time there. But as you see in the letter to Philemon, uh, Philemon owned Onesimus, who becomes a member. So you had this unique situation in the church there where you had two members, one owned the other. Is that right? No, not by our standards and not by God's standards. But it was the custom of the day, and Paul didn't seek to change it. So her household probably in included that, as well as her own people, maybe some of her own family. But um, they, were, they were baptized, and this is the custom, and we'll see that again. And she begged us, saying, 
if you judge me faithful, come to my house and stay. And she persuaded us. So we have Lydia, who becomes the first convert, the first member in her household of the church, it's going to be in Philippi. Very likely, they begin meeting in her house. But we're not done. Let's continue on. Verse 16, it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. All right, here's a, it's, it's a girl. She's, a slave, she's enslaved to a group of men that are exploiting her, but we'll call her a diviner. She's another, another woman, another female in the story. And she um, latches on to Paul here and says that these are servants of the Most High God, which um, is, an, uh, is a, uh, an inscription for the, the deity. It's even used in the Old Testament. Um, the Greeks used the particular term for Zeus. But she was led by this spirit that she was in touch with to see something about Paul. And she uh, did this for many days in verse 18. She followed them around, popped up where Paul might, might have been teaching or uh, engaging people, to the point where Paul, greatly annoyed after subsequent encounters with her, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. And so uh, this dip, spirit of definition uh, in, the, in the Greek here is telling us that she's got a, a spirit of what is called the python. And it's connected with the oracle at Delphi. And in the mythology, Delphi is over in uh, north of Corinth. In, in Greece, my, uh, major, uh, the oracle at Delphi, there was a snake, large python that was connected with that, killed by Apollo in the myth. And so when you see depictions of a, the god Apollo, he is often depicted killing this great python snake. Um, but you, know, you, you can sense the immediate connection to the serpent, the great serpent, Satan, who deceives the world, Revelation 12. And the evil spirit that is working in this woman as she has making a great deal of money for her masters in, this, in her fortune telling. And so you look at this and it's an unfortunate situation. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on um, the, you know, the details of the, the spirit and whatever else except to, to focus, I think, on, on what we're being told about this woman. I, I've dealt with people who've been bothered by demons. Uh, some who have had demon possession. I, I dealt with one woman in particular who used to actually be a witch. She uh, practiced witchcraft. We actually interviewed her for an early Beyond Today program. It's still up on the web. But uh, she was in one of my congregations at one time. And when, when you start to touch that world of black arts, black magic, Fortune telling, um, it it it's uh, you know you you want to stay away from it, but when you look at the the impact on this this woman, she is given herself over. She somehow uh, got in touch or uh, became possessed, and she uh, used it, allowed herself to be used, and then she becomes owned by her masters. This woman is abused. Let's just use the modern term. Uh, this is a very dis dysfunctional, problematic woman, and she's agitated by the spirit in her that's seeing Paul representing the Most High God, and she keeps coming back around because this demon wants to, again, attack Paul. We see the, the, a pattern. Remember the Jewish sorcerer in the city uh, down in Cyprus who um, dealt with Paul and Barnabas at that time, and Paul rebuked him. Or Sabbaths. And Satan follows around the work of God. Satan hinders the work of God. That's one of his aims and desires is to 
hinder God's people or to hinder the, the, the work that God is doing through His church. And in the book of Acts, we see, you know, close on the heels of the church, in this case, Paul preaching the gospel, there is the demonic world, the, the, the spirit world. And so Paul casts out the demon that very hour. Verse 19, her master saw that her, their hope of profit was gone. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. You know, the cash cow's gone. I don't mean to say anything about her, but, um, you know, it's gone. Their income stream is over. And so they are upset. They take it to court. They're going to sue Paul. Now, they don't care about the girl. They care about the money. They have abused her. They have ex exploited her. Now, the account doesn't say anything more about the girl other than that Paul casts out the demon. Was she baptized? Did she become a member like Lydia? It doesn't say. Some commentators suppose that she possibly did. Uh, we can't say that she was, but she's the second person that we encounter here. And let's just say for the sake of discussion, uh, the way Luke writes it, that she, didn't just, she did not just disappear from the story. What if, and it's a what if, what if she gets acquainted with Lydia? What if she begins to listen to Paul and his teaching while he's here in Philippi and becomes acquainted? What if Lydia takes her, takes pity on her, and Lydia is a prosperous woman and gives her a place to live, takes her into her household? What if? See, if you were writing a story about the church at Philippi, one of these fiction based on scriptural fact type stories, you might take that particular approach to it. I've always said that if I, if I ever retire, I, I might have the time to write such a, a story about the, the accounts here in Philippi and what happened and take a little bit of artistic license on that. But it's not unreasonable to assume something like that. Let's keep going because there's a point to this. Um, Verse 20, they brought him before the magistrates. They said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or to observe. That's a direct comment upon, upon the gospel. Because the gospel, as we're going to see in, in Thessalonica when Paul goes down there, is a message that turns the world upside down. And it was designed to turn the world of the Romans upside down because Christ is king, not Caesar. And, but we'll, and we'll see that more direct uh, in the next chapter. But this has also got to be about what, what they're saying. And so the multitude rose up together against them. The magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. There's this great tumult that erupts in the, uh, likely right in the, the Agora, and there would have been a place at the end of the Agora. The archaeological um, um, work there shows the, this location where the let's say the court would have been. And so there would have been a lot of other people there. And so they're upset. They get agitated, like, kind of like they did down in Lystra. And they, beat, they commanded them to be beaten with rods. When they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. This is Paul and Silas. Now, this is a unique situation. Paul is beaten. He's a Roman citizen. You don't do that. And we're going to see that he'll, he'll claim his Roman citizenship later, but he didn't do it in this moment. Why? We don't know. It may have been that it, events happened so quickly that they couldn't do it. It may be that Paul did not consciously want to, to call out his Roman citizenship, which would have stopped the beating because you could not do that without a trial. And he may have wanted, in a sense, to, because his... His others couldn't have done that, and the other members wouldn't have, that would have been with him probably caught up in this, and he may have wanted to be in solidarity with his own uh, fellow travelers and other members there. That's one possibility. Uh, one commentator thinks that maybe he just didn't have his passport with him, his proof of citizenship. And in the Roman world, you did carry, there was a proof of citizenship that you could carry to show that, because that was a passport to good things to have that Roman citizenship. 
We'll see that later in the, in the book of Acts. But have, you know, he, he's thrown into prison, and a jailer is to keep them securely. So now Paul and Silas are, are, are in prison. And he puts them into the inner prison, verse 24, and fastened their feet in the stocks. So they don't go in the outer prison. They go beyond that into the deepest part of it, um, and they're put in chains. Blood coming out, beaten, sore. Are they embarrassed? I don't think Paul would have been the type to be embarrassed, but they were hurting, and now they're thrown in, and I don't think they, they were given a Swanson's TV dinner along with that or whatever else. Uh, probably didn't get anything. And here they're in prison, verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. What do you do when you're upset? Discouraged? Under stress? You know a good thing to do? Sing the hymns. Sing the hymns. What's your favorite hymn? There was a time I was kind of under a lot of stress, and oh, how love I thy law, I would sing. And that picked me up. Others can do the same for you. Paul and Silas sang psalms and hymns to God right out of the, 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 the psalms, just like we do with, with our own um, hymnal. The prisoners were listening to them. So instead of blaming God, Paul and Silas praise God. Prayer and singing to keep their, their spirits up. Very powerful elements that are at work here. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, waking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. So here's a dramatic scene. Again, Peter was released from his jail that one night in Jerusalem by an angel. Here, didn't matter how far they threw Paul and Silas into the prison. Um, God can go wherever. In this case, he had a little earthquake there, which may or may not have been noticed by everybody else in the city. It could have been so localized in the area of the prison, or it could have been felt by the entire city. It, just, it, it, it shook the foundations where, where, where they were, and the doors came open. The jailer awakes and he comes, and he doesn't, he, he's supposing, it says, that the, the prisoners had fled. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself. When Paul said, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. He ran in with a light, fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Which tells you that he knew about the message of, of, of Paul. Maybe he had listened to him in the marketplace. Now this jailer very likely was a retired Roman soldier, some, some speculate. And it's, it's a sound, plausible speculation. Um, he would have been an army veteran. And he had the, the ability, he, he had the, the franchise on, on the prisons. Now, prisons are not nice places then and now. I've, in my ministry, I've been into a lot of prisons uh, to visit people who are already there. Not that I've ever been thrown in prison or anything like that, but uh, they, you know, the Indiana, Indiana Women's Prison in downtown Indianapolis, I made uh, a lot of visits there over the years and other prisons in Indiana um, to uh, visit with people who had written in for a request. Sometimes we had members there. I did one prison baptism. Remind me at another class and another time I'll tell you about that prison baptism that, that we did. It's, it's a hoot. Uh, that was a fun day. But, um, you know, going into a prison yourself, they treat you like a prisoner going in. The way you have to be you know, treated, frisked, and everything else, and the, 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 it, it's an experience. Um, it was even worse at the, in the time of, of Rome. Let me make a comment about this, this um, uh, prisoner or the jailer who was about to kill himself. It says he drew his sword. There's, there's something behind this that you have to understand. Number one, several things. Number one, uh, in the Roman world, if you had charge of a prisoner and you lost him. They escaped. You're you were you were killed. You would be you would be killed. 
all right, probably your head lopped off, which is what they did with Roman citizens. They crucified Christ and outlaws and non-Romans. They didn't do that to Roman citizens. They would have cut their head off. But to save your honor, if you knew that you were headed for that, you could take your sword and you could fall on it and run it through yourself. That's where you get the phrase, to fall on your sword. You admit, you own the problem. You take responsibility. This man was doing, he knew that he would have been killed. And to him, this was the honorable way to end his life. Strange to our ears, but this was a feature of the Roman system. Here's, here's what's important. You were a Roman, and for you, how you died was more important, or as important, and in some cases more important, than how you lived, how you died. A senator who may have fallen afoul of the Caesar was given the opportunity to run a sword through himself so he wouldn't be beheaded, and he'd take it, or drugged through the streets by a mob and his dead body thrown into the Tiber River. It was honorable for him to kill himself, and that's what this jailer is doing. Now take that, we're going to do a little diversion here. The story of Jesus at His death, you remember the Roman soldier that looked at Him when all the events happened and he saw this and he says, this indeed was the Son of God? It was a Roman soldier who said that. And he was saying it to a man that was hanging on a cross, bloodied with all the other thieves, the most ignominious death in Rome that they could administer. And this Roman soldier said, indeed, this was the Son of God. He was giving Christ the highest compliment he could give him, hanging there as treated like a criminal, because no Roman, no self-respecting Roman would have wanted to be subjected to their death by crucifixion. And for him to say that, and for it to be recorded in the Gospels, is telling us something, that you understand the depth of his admiration for Jesus when you understand the system of Roman honor that for a Roman, it was, it, was, it was more important how you died than how you lived. Christ lived a perfect life. That's more important. He, his death is important too, but He lived a sinless life to become the Lamb of God. And how we live is important. And so, understanding that behind in, in the Roman system helps you to appreciate something that was said even at, at, the, at the death of Christ. Well, Paul calls out, he says, do yourself no harm. We're all here. He called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved, you and your household. And so they spoke the word of the Lord to him. They taught him for a period of time there. All who were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and immediately he, his jailer, and all his family, were baptized. So here's the third member, the jailer and his family. He's quite a bit different from the diviner if she was a member, and he's certainly different from Lydia, who was an upper-class businesswoman. These two would have never found themselves, these people would have never found themselves in the same social gathering in Philippi. But if, again, she's she is one, but he just take even the the jailer and Lydia. Now they find themselves sitting in church together, coming from two different worlds. Think about that here for a moment. Here, verse 34, when they had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the officers, saying, Let these men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul, saying, the magistrates have said, sent to let you go, depart, go in peace. But Paul said in verse 37, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison, and now do they put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. And the soldiers told these words to the magistrates, took it back, and they were afraid when they heard they were Romans. Now they realize, uh-oh, we're in trouble. We have, we have beaten Romans. They came, hat in hand, pleaded with them, brought them out, 
and said, will you guys do us all a favor and just depart from the city? So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia, Paul and Silas. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and they departed. They move on down the road. We'll pick that up in chapter 17. But I want one final comment to make here, and that is what is, this is the beginning of the church in Philippi. This is going to be a very favored church for Paul when you read the letter to the Philippians. He says, nobody else communicated with me when I left Macedonia but you. You gave me money. And he speaks positively through the four chapters of the book of Philippians. It's a very positive, encouraging letter written from jail to this one church with whom he had a very close relationship. And here we see the foundation of it in this chapter. And if you look at the two or possibly three types of people who we could speculate make up the foundation of that church, people from different walks of life. That's what the church is. That's what the church is. People drawn by God from different walks of life into a spiritual fellowship. A Gentile, a Gentile, a Gentile, but from different strata even of the Gentile society. Now, there's neither male nor female, neither Jew nor Gentile in the church and in the body of Christ. And when that is understood at the depth of every congregation and every one of us, you have the makings for a beginning of a church like we read about here and in the letter to the Philippians, a church at Philippi that is a dynamic, spirit-led church composed of people from different backgrounds, different ideas, different experiences, but God's Spirit draws them all together. So think about that and appreciate what is happening here. And with that, you see the beginning of, of a significant congregation that we are exposed to in the book of Acts and into the New Testament.